this wraps up our discussion of the ASC05 standards, and now we're ready to move on to the NESC, the National Electrical Safety Code. The Secretariat of the NESC is IEEE, and that standard is revived on a five-year cycle, and this code body was established in 1915. This is the committee structure for the NESC, a main committee, executive subcommittee, and technical subcommittees. Most of the hands-on work is done at the technical subcommittee level. During the revision cycle, change proposals are distributed to those different subcommittees based on their topic, and then they meet to take initial votes on changes, and then that is published in a preprint for public comment, and then they reconvene, consider the comments, and vote one more time. The executive subcommittee serves to provide direction and future activities for the whole committee. And then the main committee really is the final approval for everything that gets done there. The purpose of the NESC expanded here is to provide basic provisions under the specified conditions, meaning wind and ice conditions, that are considered necessary for the safeguarding of the public, utility workers, and utility facilities. This code is not intended as a design specification or as an instruction manual. The subcommittee that's most closely aligned with the ANSI documents is subcommittee 5, addressing overhead lines, both strength and loading. Sections 24, 5, 6, and 27 are the responsibility of subcommittee 5 and we have grades of construction and then we have loading then we have strength and actually there's a section 27 on insulators that the same subcommittee is responsible for within section 24 are three grades of construction and grade b the highest grade is only required if you're crossing limited access highways railways or navigable waterways. Grade C is applied for all other standard construction and grade N is used for emergency or temporary construction and it's defined as the strength shall exceed expected loads. Besides the transverse loading on a pole there's longitudinal loading in the direction of the wires and of course vertical loading from equipment and other weight that is imposed on the poles. Generally the transverse loading is what governs so if a pole is strong enough to support the transverse wind loads it is also strong enough to support the vertical and longitudinal loads. So what makes up the transverse loads on a pole? Well, First of all you look at wind blowing on the wires and any additional ice if required depending on the district loading and then the wind blowing on the pole wind blowing on equipment the surface area of the equipment also items can have an offset you've got that vertical weight of a transformer on the side of the pole so that adds to the transverse loading and if there's any angle to the structure wire tension all of those things contribute to the transverse loading on a pole in section 25, where we talk about loading, there are three different load cases. 250B is the district loading, which applies to poles of all lengths. And it's defined as combined ice and wind loading. So most of the distribution is governed by rule 250B. When poles are taller than 60 feet above ground, both Rule 250C and Rule 250D need also to be considered to find out which is the heavier load case. 250C is just extreme wind with no ice, whereas 250D is extreme ice with concurrent wind values. This is the district load map, and again it's considered a winter storm. And we've got light, medium, and heavy loading districts. Those names actually came from a railroad ice map and the fact that in the southern part of the country 
the ice was light in the medium it's it's medium and then in the heavy it was heavy and it's because it turns out that very often the light loading may create a heavier or increased load compared to the medium loading district start with zero ice in light loading and a 60 mile an hour wind which is why the loading in light might be greater than the loading in the medium district and then heavy generally is the heaviest you add a half inch of radial ice which adds an inch to the diameter of the wires and then apply a 40 mile an hour wind just for frame of reference 40 mile an hour wind is four pounds per square foot of area so for every square foot of pole surface area and wire surface area a 40 mile an hour wind is pressing with four pounds a 60 mile an hour wind as you see is a nine pound wind so as the speed of the wind goes up the force goes up by the square of that so even a a 50 percent increase in the wind speed from 40 to 60 equates to more than doubling the force on the poles this is a graphic representation of the medium loading district first you add a quarter inch of radial ice which adds a half inch to the diameter of each wire and then you apply the 40 mile an hour wind now it's interesting to look at the additional load created by ice on different size conductors. Here you have three different conductors without ice on them and as you double the diameter each time you double the load. However, when you add a consistent thickness of radial ice to conductors the percent of increased load varies significantly depending on the size of the original diameter. This chart shows you the difference in the force on the wire sizes depending on the district that you're located in. And you can see that the light loading district increases at a much faster rate because of the higher wind speed that's applied. So when you get up to the 556, even though you're adding a half inch of diameter to the conductors, it's only a 40 mile an hour wind. And the 60 mile an hour wind without ice is a greater load. So that's an overview of Rule 250B district loading. One thing we did not mention yet is the fact that the loading on the district map is deterministic, which means it was not based on any weather data with a potential recurrence over a given time frame. It was established by people saying what's a likely expected winter storm in Pennsylvania in the heavy loading district and they came up with a half inch of ice and 40 mile an hour wind. Because these are deterministic loads the load factors, strength factors are different than for the next two load cases which do have a known probability of occurrence. Rule 250C represents an expected summer storm. And there is a 60 foot exclusion here, so once again, this load case only gets applied to poles that extend more than 60 feet above ground. You can see along the coastal areas where you get into those higher wind speeds that the pressures really go up. And for example, 90 miles an hour is at 21 pounds per square foot. And when you watch the hurricanes, on the television and you've got 130 miles an hour that's 43 pounds per square foot. So rule 250C addresses a summer storm without ice. 250D represents a winter storm once again with an extreme ice amount and whatever the concurrent wind speed was recorded with those extremes. So in this case the radial ice varies from zero to an inch and the wind speeds from 30 to 60 miles an hour. Looking at all three load cases, we already mentioned that 250B was deterministic, whereas 250C and D use weather data, created maps, and there is a real probability that is known for those conditions to occur. This summary table reiterates the fact that Rule 250B has deterministic loads and so they have to be factored 
whereas rule 250C and 250D have ultimate loads with a probability of occurrence and those are not factored. But once again 250C and D only required to be applied to poles that are more than 60 feet above ground. Now we're going to combine both strength and load. In previous editions of the NESC, the pole strength required was determined by figuring out the storm load, which is the wind and ice, and factoring that by an overload capacity factor. In grade B it was 4, and in grade C it was 2. Today's NESC uses the LRFD format, so you've got the pole strength times a strength factor, which has to be greater than the storm load times a load factor. In this case, table 253.1 addresses load factors for wood poles, and you can see that for different grades, you've got 2.5 down to 1.75. In the strength factor table, 261-1, wood structures have strength factors of 0.65 for grade B or 0.85 for grade C. What that means is for grade B, for example, you can only load the pole up to 65% of its ultimate capacity, which leaves additional margin there for safety. And here's the reference to show that ANSI 05.1 is referred to and stating that these percentages are a percent of the fiber strength values presented in ANSI 05. So we look at these two equations and realize now that here, here are the actual strength factors and load factors. And when they are combined, you end up with 3.85 for grade B and 2.06 for grade C. So when the format was changed to load resistance factored design, those factors were decided in order to basically equate to past practice. So poles are still almost four times stronger in grade B and they are two times stronger in grade C. Mentioned earlier that here are the requirements for where grade B and C are required. There aren't that many applications in the NESC where grade B is actually required. Crossing, again, limited access highways, railways, and navigable waterways. Grade C is used for a majority of distribution construction. I think the grade of construction on transmission tends to be more grade B, but there's also some grade C around the country. So let's combine all these aspects. Let's take a pole that has these attachments on it, and the wind is blowing on each one of these wires and on the pole, and we're going to equate all of that load to a 900 pound force two feet from the top of the pole. So when we look at the load and the strength sides and we're looking at a grade B construction, we take that 900 pound load times 3.85, the combined safety factor for grade B, and we come out with 3465, which is now the applied load two feet from the tip. Looking over in the ANSI class loads, we need a class two pole to support that particular load. Now if we take the exact same construction, same wires and attachments, but say, you know what, we only need grade C in this case. So now the factor is 2.06, which equals 1854, and now a class 5 pole will support that load. So that's how the loading requirements in the NESC and the class capacities in the ANSI 05.1 interrelate and work together. So keep in mind that the length and class for a pole are established by different requirements. The length is a matter of how much clearance is needed between the attachments. The class is determined by how much capacity is required for the amount of load. For example, if you had 100 foot spans, perhaps a class 4 is adequate for the load that's created. Or if you had 200 foot spans, you may need to move to a class three or a class two. So 
the bending capacity determines the class that's required and the amount of attachments and clearance needed determines the length of the pole. So we've covered at a fairly high level the major aspects of ANSI 05 standards and the NESC strength and loading in particular. Obviously there's a lot more to be learned in all of those arenas and in particular I just wanted to point you in the direction of some learning resources that apply for the NESC. You may recall that the NESC has several different subcommittees based on topics that they focus on. And IEEE then had participants from the subcommittees create online learning courses. So you can get an overview of the NESC or you can study grounding or underground clearances. There's a tremendous amount of information available through those if you're looking to understand more about the NESC. When it comes to treated wood poles, you can find extensive information from the North American Wood Pole Council. Their website at woodpoles.org features current information and an online technical library covering topics ranging from design, performance and service life, to environmental considerations and disposal. Once again, this is Nelson Bingle. Thank you for your interest.